third most collected thing in, in the world, you know, behind coins and stamps. Um, it's, it's beautiful. Um, it plays with light, it, it magnifies things, but it exists in a whole lot of forms um, that can be found in all different aspects of our daily lives, you know, from a drinking glass to the lenses in a camera or our glasses to, you know, enable us to see to um, artwork. You know, it, it's a liquid, it's a solid, um, it's different shapes. Um, it, it's um, just fascinating. It's so versatile, you know, from a fiber optic cable to uh, a paperweight. A hundred years ago, in the 1800s, there was a, a great need for containers uh, of all kinds. Plastics weren't invented yet, and we needed glass containers, glass bowls, jars, glasses, dishware, and um, all of that was, was made in, by hand uh, in a batch class environment, in a factory environment. Indiana also was uh, an incredible center for glass because we had the natural gas, we had the fuel under the ground. So from the little town of Winchester all the way to Elwood, if you just draw a straight line, kind of northwest, that's where this pocket of gas was under the ground. The factories would line up on it, drive a pipe in the ground and light it. And they had the fuel. And uh, at the time, the scientists and the, and the uh, geological people felt that there was a lifetime, unlimited amount of fuel uh, under the ground. Of course, all the factories came, and I think it was exhausted within 50 or 60 years. In the 60s, um, the studio glass movement got its uh, start with uh, Harvey Littleton and Dominic Labino doing a uh, workshop in the Toledo Museum of Art, where they focused on constructing small equipment that an individual artist could use. When I was a kid, my parents said I was really good at art, <laughs> but I had never really formally taken any art classes. So um, I don't know, you kind of, for me, just sort of learned as I went. And when I think back to my first pieces, and I remember looking, I'm going, oh, that's so beautiful. Oh my God, that is so beautiful. Well, now I think back, oh, I'm so embarrassed. <laughs> you know, there were, I didn't know how to draw and I didn't know what I was doing, but that's what's exciting about anytime you do something new. You just learn and you keep learning and then at the point you stop learning, maybe it's time to get out, you know, when you've done all the possibilities. But I'm still working on it. Uh, I was born in Winchester. So we were surrounded by all kinds of glass factories that were actually making the glass. And my father, his research work um, was in liquid diffraction of uh, x-ray diffraction of liquids, which he taught a PCHEM, uh, physical chemistry at Ball State University. And so he got very fascinated with glass and began to play with glass. And so that's how, as a young man, I became uh, very familiar with glass and, and uh, began to make things at, at the age of eight, nine, ten years old. I got involved because um Two other fellows and I had a gallery and we were buying glass from other artists and a fellow named Chris Heilman came through in a beat up old pickup truck one time selling uh, goblets and vases and we bought from him and then we wanted to reorder and he said I can't come you'll have to come and pick it up. So I drove to Athens, Ohio to his studio and uh, he was working that evening and I got to see the equipment and he let me try it and if you're of a particular mindset you know and you're exposed to something like that it it's infectious you know I uh, I got to make a little paperweight that night and then driving back all I could think of was building kilns and making tools and um, doing all that. Glass it breaks you know, you can't paint over it if it breaks. Now I can, if I'm doing a metal overlay and I go, ooh, you know, I, I don't like this, it's too stubby, or I want to branch here, I can add and subtract on that. But if I get the overall drawing wrong, I just have to start all over. You know, if it breaks, which is, this is why I'm one of the few people that does this work. 
it is so easy to break the glass because you have to solder it and glass glass you know if it's not annealed properly or if there's any sometimes there's little pieces of sand or dirt or there's tiny cracks in there so anything can break it that is heartbreaking it's an element of risk you, you have to approach it with that in mind you know i mean you're let alone the tools but the equipment you're dealing with gas and electricity and and things that are 2000 degrees hot you know um it, it's a little frustrating not being able to touch, you know, a piece of art that you're creating. But um, you just learn to respect all those issues. And uh, I've, I've got all my fingers and haven't burned myself. And um, I guess I've been lucky. Because every day you come to work, uh, it's something different, something new that you're making. There are no molds, and so there's... Uh, uh, there is a sense of uh, repetitiveness, but the repetitiveness is really an important uh, part of, of what we do in glass because that rehearsal process of making hundreds and hundreds of the same item over and over, the quality improves. Glass is interesting because of the way the light's transmitted through it. It's vibrant and it's, al and it's literally alive. Glass is literally in a state of flux all its life. You know, it's always going from the components and then being made and then back to gravity you know it's always sinking very very slowly but it's in constant motion and i think i don't know it just it's the textures and the light i think it's very exciting